Welcome to our next episode of this Revival History Series. Today we're going to be talking about the Azusa Street Revival. We'll take you right into an important and catalytic moment. William J. Seymour becomes known as the face or the primary leader of this future movement. But I want to take you into his hunger for God and the power of the Holy Spirit. He's so desiring growth and more teaching that he decides to go to Texas where a famous kind of well-known preacher is teaching on the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, when he gets there, he's confronted by the injustice of the racism of his day and he's not allowed to sit in the classroom in an unsegregated way. However, his humility is more powerful than the injustice. And he says, I'm not missing what God has for me. He sits in the hallway and in profound biblical humility, he receives everything that God would have for him. Now, how is it that God would take that man and those horrible circumstances and so redeem it that his very movement, it's said of it, that the, that the color line was washed away by the blood of Jesus. This is one of the things we're going to talk about as we jump into the Azusa Street Revival. A couple of things to look at in this story. Number one, humility. Humility always wins. The Sermon on the Mount lifestyle is a winning lifestyle. It overcomes obstacles. It overcomes rejection and it overcomes injustices. Number two, we're going to talk about real success. Not just being found in numbers or visible impact, but simply in obedience to God. Now, as we start this story, we're going to go to Los Angeles in the early 1900s. You know we have the Welsh Revival going on in 1904 in Wales. Well, around the same time in America... There are leaders, pastors, and individuals who are getting a burden for revival. They're believing that God wants to move in America in an unprecedented way. Critical moment happens when a pastor from Los Angeles travels to Wales, experiences the move of God there, comes back to Los Angeles, and the first Sunday that he preaches, a spirit of revival is stirred in the people and they gain confidence. Now is the time. Simultaneously that, this incredible little book, I have a, a real original copy of the Welsh Revival and all these newspaper clippings that were written into a book and all these first-hand testimonies. It's printed and it's sent all over and one lands in Los Angeles with Frank Bartleman who became known as the intercessor for the Azusa Street Revival. This book is passed around and it becomes a seed of faith that now is the time for a move of God in America. Now it's around this time where their meeting and prayer is starting to bubble up in Los Angeles that Seymour receives an invitation from Los Angeles from a church to come and pastor and he feels this is God and he feels this is going to be the place where he can walk out all of this newfound teaching and this passion for the outpouring of the Spirit. But he moves to Los Angeles and his teachings are too radical for the church. They go, this is beyond what we're comfortable with, and because of it, he's rejected. Now, again, think about this. Seymour has had so many opportunities in his life to give up on the call of God. He was born in poverty. Um, he overcame sickness in his life. Then he has this moment in Texas and enduring racism. Now he finally has a breakthrough opportunity, and after maybe one or two Sundays, he's kicked out of the church. He's rejected. He's too radical for them. What do you do in this moment? Well, Seymour had a humility that was bigger than all the obstacles the enemy could throw at him. And he finds a living room on Bonnie Bray Street. I've been there. You can drive up to the house where it all began. In this little home in a living room with 30 or 40 people, they began to gather. Frank Bartleman's in deep intercession and fasting. Seymour is teaching and talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're believing that an outpouring is coming. Well, on April 9th, uh, 1906, everything changed. A little, uh, uh, an open heaven over the Bonnie Bray Street house, and the first group of followers of Jesus are filled afresh with the power of the Holy Spirit. This was not just a, we hope we got filled. This was not wishful thinking. This was a demonstration of God's power. They began to speak in tongues, and it became a phenomenon that people were not used to. They hadn't seen, but they had had faith for it. And it marked this move of God as a supernatural move of God. Now, soon these meetings began to outgrow this little Bonnie Bray street. And so we come into this this 10-day period of time that changed history. You may remember from the Welsh Revival, we talked about these 10 days that changed all of human history. Well, we're about to talk about another 10 days that shaped human history. They're praying, they're gathering, 
The Spirit's moving. Frank Bartleman decides it's time for a 10-day fast. He's already fasted and prayed so much, so much that people were concerned over his health, but he knew they were on the brink and he refused to give up. He goes into the 10-day fast. The Spirit's moving. Well, three days in, San Francisco experiences a massive earthquake and 10,000 people die in this natural disaster. Urgency hits the body of Christ. Soul seeking is going on everywhere. Um, People are asking the big questions in life. And in the midst of this, this praying crew uh, on Bonnie Bray Street says, now is the time. There is an urgency for a move of God. They would gather a few days later and because of so many, the porch of the Bonnie Bray house would break and they said, we've got to find a bigger place. And 10 days after the start of the 10 day fast, uh, since the start of that outpouring of the spirit on April 19th, the doors are open to a broken down old wooden church on Azusa Street. Now again, look at William J. Seymour's humility. Willing to meet in a living room with 30 or 40 people, but he's got a burden for a breakthrough that's national and global. Finally, someone opens their doors and it's a dilapidated old and barely used church. But for him, it was the manger that God wanted to pour out his spirit. On April 19th, they moved to Azusa Street and the power of God is poured out without measure. It was said in that day that two to three blocks from Azusa Street, you could already feel the tangible presence of God. The meetings were marked by great outpouring, the glory of God. Again, things that were indescribable to those who were in the room. Often Seymour would hide himself under a box because he didn't want to touch the glory. He didn't want to be seen as the leader. The Holy Spirit was the leader of these meetings. And soon people were gathering from all over the nation and 1,500 people a night were now meeting in this dilapidated old wooden building. Meetings would often go till 10 in the morning, till midnight, filled with hungry people seeking the power and the presence of God, regularly filled, baptized with the power of the Spirit, speaking in tongues. This was a phenomenon to all who were watching. Now get this, within two years of the beginning of this outpouring, all 50 states in America had established Pentecostal movements, established churches. Within two years, all 50 states. Beyond that, all 50 nations around the world were so touched by the move of God and those who came to be a part of it that you had permanent established Pentecostal movements in 50 nations of the world, all within two years. Now, I want you to imagine, just walk with me right now onto Azusa Street. Picture an older, wooden, nothing glamorous, nothing pretty building, but big enough to hold 1,500 worshipers at the same time. Walk in the back of that church, it's nothing to look at. But when you walk in the doors, in fact, before you ever even got there, the tangible glory of God was so real and so profound, you knew that you had stepped into a different reality. When you walked into the back of that church, you felt the hunger of the people, you saw the outpouring of the Spirit, but something else caught your eye. This was not a segregated gathering. This was not a picture of one race meeting together. This didn't look like the segregation that society was going through at the time. This looked more like heaven. It was said that 20 nations could be found at any given time in that chapel, worshiping from all over the world, from many different ethnicities. It was said at this time that women were being empowered to teach and to preach, that old and young, black and white, 20 nations at a time experiencing the outpouring and the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a piece of heaven on earth. Now this is insane, but today, out of this, the Welsh revival, today the largest expression of Protestant Christianity on the earth is the Pentecostal charismatic movement that can be traced back to the Welsh revival and to this moment in the Azusa Street revival. Now William Seymour, the humble leader that catalyzed it. Even once he experienced the outpouring, you would think finally he had the breakthrough. Well, in an eternal sense, they had the breakthrough. In a kingdom sense, they had the breakthrough. But in Seymour's life, in the years to come, he would experience three major significant betrayals. His spiritual father that had helped him turned against him and claimed that Seymour was not the leader of this and he hadn't started it, but that this leader had started it. One of his co-workers stole his entire mailing list that was spreading the message of the outpouring of the Spirit all over the world, stole the mailing list and took it over for themselves. 
Someone else, a friend, took the name of his church, which of course was famous for this outpouring of the Spirit, named their church the same thing and claimed that they were the catalyst to the outpouring. Imagine these betrayals, but to his dying day, William Seymour was known for humility, for his overcoming faith. And though he saw great things even in his day, he had no idea that 110 years later, we would look out at the entire globe and every single nation on earth marked by the Azusa Street outpouring. His humility changed all of human history and his success was not in the visible impact he could see in his day. His success was that he'd been obedient to God, wholly and fully surrendered. Now, before we wrap up this session, I just want to give you a couple things to highlight personal applications. Number one, the obstacles that come against us in our lives, the opportunities for unforgiveness, for offense, for betrayal that causes so much pain that we give up, for real injustices, real ones that will come against us. These are all moments where the enemy is trying to get us to quit. William J. Seymour, many leaders in history, they embody a humility that overcame in the injustices, the betrayal, and the pain of their lives. This is remarkable to think that the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle and that humility which bows low in the midst of pain and brokenness and rejection, the humility that goes lower these and these things actually ends up rising above them. And humility is always victorious in the face of the worst betrayals and the worst injustices we could possibly experience. Guys, God wants to mark us with a humility more powerful than anything the enemy could throw at, it, throw at us, and no obstacle could keep us from hunger for God. Number two is that Seymour embodied a success that was based in simple obedience. Whether it was sitting in a hallway, whether it was uh, moving to a living room and you're rejected by the church that invited you to pastor, whether it's moving from a living room to a kind of broken down old uh, wooden church that nobody's really in, again and again, he showed that success was obedience to God. It was following the hunger that God had placed in it. And because of it, Seymour was faithful to his dying day, to the word of the Lord over his life. And now we look back and go, his obedience changed all of human history, but he was successful whether he saw the fruit of his obedience or not. Our success is in simply obeying God. Now, as we wrap up this episode, stay tuned because our final episode is gonna be one of our most remarkable. We're gonna talk about the Hebrides outpouring. 